Pyrophoric chemicals like butyl lithium are essential to synthetic chemists, but these highly reactive materials can ignite on contact with air or water. This program will review the unique hazards of pyrophoric chemicals and discuss laboratory scale handling. Before beginning lab work, you must be trained and gain experience working with hazardous materials. Training should include observation and direct supervision by a subject matter expert. Develop and review operating procedures. Review literature references and material safety data sheets prior to starting laboratory work. Maritas is a postdoctoral researcher with experience handling hazardous materials and pyrophoric liquids. My overall research goal is to synthesize new phosphine ligands and then bind them to metals to make new catalysts, to make um, new drugs, or as an example, in L-DOPA, which is a treatment for Parkinson's disease. In the process today, it's the synthesis of my starting materials to get to a new phosphine ligand that I'm aiming to synthesize and bind to a metal. Pyrophoric liquids such as organolithium reagents are very versatile reagents for a synthetic organic chemist because they can, um, they're very efficient in making carbon-carbon bonds. This program includes information on the identification and storage of pyrophoric liquids, laboratory setup, emergency equipment, protective clothing, handling procedures, and emergency procedures. Common pyrophoric compounds include organolithiums, alkyl magnesium, zinc, and aluminum compounds, phosphines, silanes, Grignard reagents, and boranes. Pyrophoric substances react on contact with air or water. They can produce heat and flammable or toxic gases. They are often shipped in sealed glass bottles or cylinders with a dry inert gas in the container headspace. Some pyrophoric materials are dissolved in flammable solvents in different concentrations. Over time, evaporation of the carrier solvent can concentrate or increase the hazard. It may be necessary to titrate older containers to determine the concentration before use. Certain compounds or concentrations are more reactive and more dangerous than others. Consider the risk and purchase the least hazardous or toxic alternative. Minimize your inventory and purchase only a one or two month supply. Always follow manufacturer guidance on storage location and conditions. Glass bottles of pyrophoric reagents should not be stored unprotected. The metal can shipped with each bottle can be retained as a protective container for transport and storage. Keep the manufacturer's label intact and ensure the chemical name and hazard warnings are legible. Many pyrophoric reagents are stored in specially designed explosion-proof refrigerators. Look for Underwriters Laboratory, National Fire Protection Association, and Occupational Safety and Health Administration ratings. Always remember to purchase a one or two month supply, follow manufacturer storage recommendations, store away from heat, flame, and incompatible materials, and use refrigerators designed for flammable liquid storage. The laboratory should be neat and organized. All hazardous materials not in use should be stored in chemical storage cabinets. Ensure clear access to emergency shower and eye wash units. Have a dry chemical fire extinguisher nearby. Dry chemical extinguishers are best for most pyrophoric materials. CO2 and Class D extinguishers are not ideal as they may react with or have limited effectiveness on pyrophoric fires. Hands-on fire extinguisher training should be considered for high-risk work locations. You should never work alone when handling pyrophoric materials. A coworker can make the difference in the event of a fire or spill. 
Pyrophoric transfers should occur in a chemical fume hood. Check the fume hood local alarm or flow monitor to confirm hood airflow. Remove all unneeded chemicals, combustibles, and equipment. Keep the fume hood sash as low as possible to provide splash, fire, and impact protection. A portable shield can provide additional splash, impact, and fire protection. An inert glove box can also be used if available, but this will require additional training and supervision. Preparation is important with all high-risk operations. Remember these key points in planning your work. Never work alone. Keep the lab neat and organized. Safely store all unneeded chemicals. Ensure access to eyewash and safety shower. Have a dry chemical extinguisher nearby and know how to use it. Work in a chemical fume hood or inert glove box. Protective clothing is the essential last line of defense from chemical exposure. When you work in the lab, you should wear a lab coat, long pants, and closed-toed shoes to minimize exposure. Work with flammable liquids and reactive materials calls for additional protection. A flame or fire-resistant lab coat is designed to insulate the skin from burns and stop flame propagation. Look for a flame-resistant label. This includes Nomex and other treated fabrics. Disposable, single-use nitrile gloves provide a barrier to chemical absorption with minimal loss of dexterity and tactility. Nomex gloves can be used in the laboratory to provide flash fire protection, but may impair dexterity. Researchers may feel clumsy with these gloves and will need to be comfortable handling containers, cannula, and equipment prior to beginning work. Primary eye and face protection is provided by the fume hood sash or portable shielding. In addition, safety glasses should be worn whenever working in the lab. Chemical splash goggles and face shields can also be used for additional eye protection. Look for the ANSI Z87 stamp on all protective eyewear to ensure it meets design standards. Protective clothing provides an important barrier in the event of an accident. Minimize exposed skin when working with hazardous materials. Use a flame-resistant lab coat in high-risk environments. Work behind a physical barrier. Wear ANSI-approved eye protection. Wear chemical and or flame-resistant gloves. Single-use nitrile gloves provide dexterity and splash protection, but are not fire-resistant. There are a number of methods available to transfer pyrophoric liquids. This video will demonstrate the use of a cannula and a Schlenk line. The Schlenk system provides a dry, inert environment for the work. The cannula is a double tip needle used to transfer the reagent from its container. A Schlenk line is a double manifold system made from borosilicate glass. One side of the manifold is connected to an inert dry gas source and the other side is connected to a vacuum pump. A system of valves allows researchers to pull a vacuum, introduce inert gas, or isolate containers attached to the Schlenk line. The vacuum side of the manifold is fitted with a cold trap to protect the vacuum pump. The inert gas manifold is exhausted through an oil bubbler to ensure no air enters the system. All glassware containers, cannula, and needles should be cleaned and dried in a drying oven at 125 degrees Fahrenheit overnight or 140 degrees Fahrenheit for at least four hours. The hot glassware should be cooled in an inert atmosphere by assembling the glassware while hot and flushing with a stream of dry nitrogen or argon. 
A thin film of silicone or hydrocarbon grease must be used on all standard taper joints to prevent seizure upon cooling. Always check glassware, fittings, and connections for damage or cracks. Ensure a dry and pure gas source sufficient to complete the reaction. Nitrogen or argon should have no more than 5 parts per million moisture or oxygen content. This hood is supplied with dry nitrogen that is passed through drying columns as a final precaution. The nitrogen line is also connected to a mineral oil bubbler that provides 3 to 5 pounds per square inch of back pressure and prevents air from entering the system. A vacuum pump below the workbench is connected to the system through a cold trap. Confirm pump operation and fill the cold trap with liquid nitrogen before work begins. The reaction container should be pre-filled with dry solvent as your research dictates and sealed. Purchase high purity solvents and use purification columns to remove trace water or impurities. Reactions with pyrophorics are often exothermic so reaction vessels should be oversized to allow for expansion. The reaction container must also be continuously stirred. Use a cold bath to maintain constant temperature. Select a cold bath that is non-flammable and inert. Liquid nitrogen, dry ice, and ice water can reduce risk compared to solvent-based cold baths. Both the reaction container and transfer container must be purged of air and moisture before work. This is done by connecting each container to the Schlenk line and alternating between vacuum and inert gas for at least three cycles. Both containers remain under inert gas pressure ready for the transfer operation. You are now ready to begin the pyrophoric liquid transfer. Remember, never work alone, clear the work area, wear the proper protective equipment, and recheck setup and supplies before work begins. The transfer outlined here involves two steps. The first step is to transfer butylithium from the reagent container to a transfer container. This allows accurate measurement of the reagent and will minimize the volume of pyrophoric liquid handled during the reaction. The second step is the transfer of pyrophoric liquid from the transfer container to the reaction container at a controlled addition rate. Retrieve the reagent container from storage and clamp it in place in the chemical fume hood to prevent tipping. Carefully remove the cap and any paraffin seals that may have been applied. Cannula and needles are used to puncture the Teflon container seal to add dry inert gas or remove liquid. To preserve this seal, use the smallest gauge needle possible, no larger than 18 gauge. Insert a needle with dry inert gas from the Schlenk line and use a second needle to vent the gas from the container. Remove the vent needle from the reagent container and replace it with the cannula. Take care to keep the cannula in the headspace above the liquid level. The other end of the cannula is inserted into the septa on the transfer container and a vent needle is added. Inert gas is now flowing into the reagent container headspace, through the cannula into the transfer container, and out the vent needle. Check the liquid level in the reagent container and lower the cannula into the liquid to begin transfer. Take your time. Inert gas pressure will slowly move the pyrophoric liquid through the cannula. Check the reagent container. The cannula should be below the liquid level until the desired volume of pyrophoric liquid has been transferred. Uh, 
Raise the cannula into the headspace of the reagent container and allow inert gas to remove the remaining pyrophoric liquid from the cannula for at least 30 seconds. Make sure the cannula remains in the headspace of the transfer container. Open the gas supply to the transfer container and remove the vent needle. You can now remove the cannula from the reagent container and insert a vent needle. Insert the cannula into the reaction vessel and insert a vent needle. You have now transferred 10 milliliters of pyrophoric liquid to the transfer container. Dry inert gas is passing into the headspace of the transfer container, through the cannula, and into the reaction container, and out the vent needle. The reagent container should be purged with dry inert gas, resealed, and returned to storage at this time. This will minimize the risk of fire or spill. This process will now be repeated to move the pyrophoric liquid from the transfer container to the reaction container. This is initiated by closing the gas supply to the reaction container and moving the cannula below the liquid level in the transfer container. When the transfer vessel is empty, allow inert gas to purge the cannula for at least 30 seconds. You can now open the gas supply to the reaction container and remove the cannula from both the reaction container and transfer container for cleaning. Leave the reaction vessel purged with inert gas and a vent needle to accommodate heat or expansion. The cannula and transfer container should be cleaned promptly. Use a compatible solvent to rinse pyrophoric residues. Flush this solvent in 2-propanol to safely remove any reactive characteristic from the waste. Collect and label as hazardous waste for disposal. The Schlenk line and cannula transfer method uses inert gas to move pyrophoric liquids from one container to the next. Some key points to remember include Ensure a dry inert gas and vacuum source before work begins. Use low pressure, dry, inert gas, maximum three to five pounds per square inch pressure. Dry and purge all glassware before work begins. Ensure the cannula is empty before removing from containers. Keep the fume hood sash as low as possible at all times. The cannula method eliminates the risk of handling a syringe charged with reactive material. Transfers of small volumes, less than 10 milliliters, can be performed with specialized syringes. Syringe volume must be twice the volume transferred to allow plunger travel distance. For a 10 milliliter transfer, you would use a 20 milliliter syringe at a minimum. Syringes should have locking or threaded fittings to the needle. As with the Schlenk system, a dry inert purge reaction vessel and a source of dry inert gas with a backflow bubbler are also required. Small spills or releases of pyrophoric material may self-extinguish in the container or hood bench. For this reason, and before work begins, it is essential that you keep the lab and work area neat and organized and remove unneeded material. Ensure clear access to emergency shower and eye wash and wear protective equipment. In the event of a small spill or fire, pull the fume hood sash closed and stop work. Follow your emergency protocols and consult your principal investigator or supervisor to report the incident. In the event of a large spill, fire, or exposure to pyrophoric liquid, it is essential to flush exposed clothing or skin in the safety shower or eye wash. 
If safe to do so, close the fume hood sash and doors to the lab. Activate the nearest fire alarm and call 911 to report the accident.